Along the way, he received three Fulbright teaching grants. At one point, he operated a pomegranate ranch in southern Iran. This he did for a couple of years. Always he was writing and publishing articles and stories in journals all over the place. In 1972, Mr. O'Donnell came back to Portland and moved into his old childhood neighborhood. He became an adjunct professor of Middle East Studies at Portland State and worked at the Oregon Historical Society in all sorts of capacities. And he kind of retired in 1991. And from this past, Terence O'Donnell sat on and does sit on a unique prominence that allows him particular value as an observer of Portland and of Oregon. He has written five books about both Oregon and Iran. His most recent, An Arrow in the Earth, General Joel Palmer and the Indians of Oregon, was published in 1991. He's made guest appearances on national radio and television shows, Dick Cavett, Good Morning America, and he's spoken widely in the United States, in public, fora, and at universities. Locally, his talents have served the Library Foundation, the Pioneer Courthouse Square, whose design he participated in, and he even wrote the words that serve as text for Oregon's Vietnam Memorial. Not so surprisingly, he has been impressively honored for these accomplishments, including the Northwest Booksellers Award, the 19, and in 1992, the C.S. Wood Award by the Oregon Institute of Literary Arts for his most distinguished career. Today, we are honored, very honored, that Terence O'Donnell has agreed to speak to us on Portland, its character, its felicity, and its future. Please join me in welcoming Terence O'Donnell. You're very thorough, Dr. Storrs, and I thank you very much. Good day, and uh, thank you very much for coming. <clears throat> I am complimented and flattered by being asked to talk to the City Club. It's the third occasion, I think. Some years ago, maybe it was many years ago, um, I came and tried to explain the Iranian side of the hostage crisis. They, of course, had a different side from us. And then about, um, maybe it was 10 years ago, a two-ring circus. Um, I was in one ring, and Tom Vaughn was in the other. I, I, Tom talked about the future of Portland, and I talked a little bit about the past. Today, Hmm. I've developed a running nose just in time for all of this. <clears throat> this is a little uh, blather of bits and pieces, uh, this and that, on the city, and I have called it reflections <clears throat> of an Oregon, or reflections rather, of a downtown streetwalker. I have to remind you that a promenading tart is not the only meaning of the word. In the less hurried past, when time had more bend to it, uh, a streetwalker could also be an idler, an ambler, a person whose pleasure it is to dawdle about on downtown streets and savor a city's life. In this old sense of the term, <clears throat> there are still a few street walkers about, and I am one of them, and downtown Portland uh, is my beat. <laughs> I live actually downtown uh, much of the year, you know, the remainder at the seacoast, but I'm, I'm often in town and walk when I am here. Well, 
Why is it a pleasure to a streetwalker? For one thing, it's simply a pleasant place in which to walk. <clears throat> and for another, it's really very instructive. Just as the human face uh, reflects the character behind it, uh, so a place may reflect the attitudes and values, the general bent <clears throat> of the people who over time have lived in it and formed its spirit. But first to the simple uh, pleasant uh, pleasures of walking uh, in the downtown, one appeal lies in the fact <clears throat> that the Portland downtown is comprehensible. For this mile-wide sloping shelf between the river and the hills is defined and bounded. <clears throat> it's not some sprawl lost in distance, an overpowering vastness reducing us to insignificance, to, to feeling like a fly in the city streets. Then, too, it is literally walkable for a str slow stroller like myself, no more than half an hour from one end of the shelf to the other, and even less to cross the shelf from the river uh, to the hills. Next, and remembering that the streetwalker is also an idler, agreeable places to sit down and observe the passing so, uh, places to do so are also a must in the downtown, and the downtown is really very well equipped. There are the benches on the 5th and 6th Street malls. I wonder how many of you have ever actually sat down on them. But at any rate, uh, they are there. The benches of the parks, and most, I think, inviting at all, uh, of all the 20 or so benches set into the balustrades of the library. Also much favored uh, for sitting by idlers like myself are all the downtown ledges and low walls. Pioneer Square has lots of ledges. Pioneer Courthouse, especially on the east side, has a very nice low wall to sit on. There are, too, <coughs> the sidewalk cafes. At, uh, and at last, because for some years they were prohibited. Uh, in youth, this streetwalker <clears throat> was reproved by his elders for walking down Fifth Street eating an apple. Bad form eating on the street, not done in the proper Portland view. Indeed, this city has always been uh, very concerned about its decorum. In 1852, 1852, the Oregonian complained that, quote, our city has of late been the scene of disgraceful Bacchanalian revelry, disgusting to every sober mind. 30 years later, Mr. John Courtney, who opened a little theater down on, I think it was down on 3rd, uh, he forbade the eating of peanuts, cat calls, and whistling. He said, um, this again is a quote, we regard all our patrons as ladies and gentlemen and expect all to conduct themselves as such. <clears throat> Still another 30 years later, all streetcar steps were lowered so that the ladies of the town could, quote, ascend and descend without being subjected to the leers of male loiterers. <laughs> well, they could see an ankle, and uh, that really sent them off. <laughs> and today we have the green-jacketed Portland guides patrolling the streets to see that we do not misbehave. Nonetheless, the bonds of decorum have been loosened somewhat, 
and si sidewalk cafes are now legally permitted. The idling streetwalkers delight, and where, as the Irish say, they may watch, even leer, as the world and his wife pass by. <coughs> streetwalkers, of course, have other uh, demands uh, besides places to sit. Shade in summer, for example, provided by the street trees and the trees of the six downtown blocks, uh, downtown, sorry, parks, and then a roof in winter, which is provided by the device with which all Portland street walkers are equipped, and it's called the umbrella. The most essential condition, however, for any dedicated street walker is variety. A variety of districts, of institutions, and of people. With respect to varieties of districts, take for starters Portland Center. That 54 area, 54 block area at the south end of the downtown. I'm turned around. Which, what, which direction? What's that now? That's south. Mm -hmm. oh, at the south end of the downtown shelf, and originally one of the town's few ethnic districts. It used to be called South Portland. Portland has never been a very ethnic city, nor has it ever sought to be so. In the 1890s, that decade when the ethnic character of many American cities became pronounced. The Oregonian Handbook, this was a handbook, kind of a guide put out by the Oregonian newspaper. <clears throat> it proudly reported, uh, this is again is in 1890, and the quote, the dregs, uh, the dregs have not reached us. The beauty of the city is not marred by the debasing influence of foreign paupers. Mm -hmm. In the 1940s, Robert Moses, the famous New York planner, came to Portland, and he wrote, again, this is the 1940s, quote, um, Portlanders believe it is neither possible nor desirable to keep all of the war workers attracted from other parts of the country. Now, some would argue that the result of such attitudes, which is to say the relative uh, absence of ethnicity, has made for a rather bland city, one lacking in the flavor which ethnicity imparts. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever encountered a sort of typical Boston Mick or a sort of typical, typical New York Jew or a sort of typical uh, New Jersey Italian. But at any rate, try to imagine a room and put that Mick and Jew and Italian in the room with a, somebody from Portland and listen to them discuss something. The Portlander will sound very flat and really also very lacking in humor, whereas those other three will be full of fireworks, full of fireworks. Well, in any event, it is not surprising that when funds for urban renewal <coughs> became available in the 1960s, the area chosen for leveling was Portland's last remaining uh, ethnic neighborhood, that distinctness lost. Still, what replaced it is distinct as well, however different from the environment which preceded it. With its residential high-rises, uh, Pietro Belushki considered them the best of Portland's 1960s architecture. Its quiet, tree-lined footpaths, I take you all know, I take it you all know what I mean by Portland Center, everything south of the auditorium, that 54-block area. 
At any rate, it's quiet. The tree-lined footpaths, three parks, two grand fountains, lots of bird song, and no cars except at the periphery and through the center, Harrison Street. Um, anyway, there is no other place in the city uh, like it. The next example reflecting this variety of districts and which though immediately adjacent to Portland Center is of course in total contrast to it and that is this immediate downtown. Traffic, crowds, offices, shops, government, and here the basic architectural character is from the first quarter of the century and which the New York Times once described, quote, as some of the most beautifully detailed and dignified 20th century classical, classic revival buildings in the nation. And they're referring, they were, that was Ada Louise Huxtable, referring of course, of course, to these white terracotta and brick facades or going and building the Journal Tower, there are lots of them downtown, and which light uh, the downtown like a lamp. Next on the shelf, and again in total contrast, is the North End, to call it by its historic, uh, to call this historic district by its historic name. I always thought it was a great irony that when they made it historic district, they, they threw out the historic name, the North End, and called it Old Town. You couldn't be more trite and trendy. Every town in the city has an old town. At any rate, there in the 19th century, um, uh, and especially in the 1860s, those cast iron fronts went up, um, and um, with it, uh, the, that was the first of the cast iron fronts that went up in the 1860s, and with their successors today, one of the largest collection of such facades in the nation. Actually, before we started putting in the bridge ramps and tearing buildings down around front, it was the largest collection of cast iron fronts in, in the United States. Very impressive. Well, there um, in the North End is that mixture of ethnic restaurants, boutiques, and flop houses, which contribute to the North End's very special identity. So each downtown Portland district then is the product of a different historical period, each with its own architectural style, each with its own <coughs> function, and all three traversable, as I said earlier, by a sauntering street walker in uh, no more than half an hour. It is an easily accessible variety of which few American downtowns can boast. In addition, these three districts span more than a century uh, between them and thus make the Portland downtown time deep. It's a wonderful phrase of the late Kevin Lynch at Harvard, or maybe he was MIT. And he said, ideally, a town should be time deep. Um, and it is a reminder, a time deep place, to the musing street walker that we are only, that there were others uh, here before us, and that others too will be here after all of us have left. A circumstance it is perhaps as well to keep in mind. Another variety which the street walker enjoys and missing from the suburban malls, might be noted, is the downtown's variety of institute houses. Uh, there used to be a hospital up on 10th and Morris, and I think that's gone now. Some schools, a university, private clubs, churches, the city hall, several child care centers, a library, a detail those uh, narrow windows of the Justice Center's middle stories. If you look at it, you'll see this, and maybe not quite a foot in width. 
and behind each of those out of sight out of mind the old saying goes the reverse of course is true as well so passing the jail or the hospital the streetwalker feels sorrow for the sick and the confined but also grateful for being free and well indeed the importance to the streetwalker of all these institutions is that they are emblems of the variety of human states and activities, not just buying and selling, but also governing and judging, teaching and learning, praying and playing, birthing and dying. All those things which make up a society and which the observant streetwalker is not apt to forget walking uh, the downtown streets. Still another form of variety important to the streetwalker is a variety of routes going places different ways. Uh, here in a sense um, our downtown is deficient for as in most American cities the streets are laid out on a grid there is an old uh, Norwegian folk ditty which says, straight is the line of duty, but curved is the line of beauty. And uh, <clears throat> a streetwalker, of course, by definition, is not interested really in either straight lines uh, or duty. There are, however, two escapes from these dutiful straight lines. Uh, one is the cut through. Uh, the ability to pass from one street to another through the ground floor levels of a number of the downtown buildings. Now, this at least permits a zigzag, uh, if not a curve. Further, it provides some distinct contrasts uh, in the human scene. The aisles of the department stores, the foyers of the office buildings, the corridors of the courthouse. Um, I walk every, every morning for a half hour, 45 minutes, and sometimes in, in the park block, sometimes along the river, but very often right into the city. I live at Broadway and Jefferson, and I always go through the courthouse because it reminds me of other kinds of people. The other escape from the <laughs> grid are the parks. Uh, the park blocks and the plaza blocks, I don't know if they're known by that anymore, the two courthouse, three courthouse squares now, uh, the parks of Portland Center and the parks on the riverbank. Um, there are few American downtowns where a pedestrian, as in Portland, is never more than three or four blocks um, from a park this extraordinary uh, felicity, this ability in the Portland downtown to pass so easily from pavement and building walls to spongy turf and, and shade of trees. In addition to this refreshment and the license the parks provides for an errant path, there is the related fact that with um, all the planters on the 5th and 6th Street malls, as well as the number of landscape setbacks, building setback from the pavement. The downtown, especially in spring, is a garden. The final and perhaps most important variety which a streetwalker must have is a variety of people to watch. Is the streetwalkers, is the streetwalker peculiar in relishing this form of variety? Some would appear to think so. Oh, I never go downtown, they announced with a proud sniff. Uh, why? Parking, the homeless safety, these problems uh, do figure in the reluctance of some to venture into the downtown, but often and suspiciously they exaggerate the problem to the point where wonders if they aren't perhaps, uh, perhaps pretext. Perhaps more fundamental to this reluctance to brave the downtown 
seen is the simple, plain fear of differentness. The old American fear, with which we do our best to obliterate with efforts at conformity. Thus, the preference for the suburb, with its local mall, everyone at about the same income level, everyone having about the same values, everyone pretty much a mirror of image of each other. It is certainly more comfortable, certainly less threatening, but it is also certainly more narrow, and to this streetwalker at least, certainly more dull. In any event, those who prefer a spectrum of human types will find it, indeed so, in the downtown. The one place in the city where all the different kinds of people who make up the city come together. Executives walking to their clubs, punk kids congregating on their corner of the square, food vendors with their carts, cops trotting by on horseback, matrons waiting for a taxi, joggers loping past, old people at rest on the benches of the park, toddlers from the nursing schools, nursery schools holding hands at crossings. Old and young, rich and poor, the sane, the mad, black, brown, and white, all of us. These then are some of the varieties which pleasure a downtown streetwalker. But there is another feature too, which for streetwalkers must, uh, makes the downtown an ideal place. They can look out and see the land in which the city lies. And they can as well look up and see the air and sky. The downtown comprises, the general downtown, comprises, I think they say about 300 blocks. 50 of those are in parks and plazas. For an American city, an extraordinary proportion of open to built up land. Then our blocks compared to the blocks of most cities are quite small, and thus we have more streets, which in turn mean more openings to the sky. Also, the average building height, if you look around, is only four or five stories. I'm not sure even that. There are lots of two-story buildings downtown. <laughs> Some of the recent extreme exceptions uh, to that um, average height compensate in part for their light blocking height by setbacks. The result of all this is that to a far greater degree than in most cities we can see the sky and receive the light. Nowhere is this more happily, fortunately, the case than the east-west four block strip, which forms the very center of our downtown. Those blocks occupied by Nordstrom's, about three stories, Pioneer Square, open, the courthouse, two or three stories, Pioneer Place with its sort of glass pagoda again, two or three stories. Um, so three very low rise blocks, one entirely open. So thus, and so importantly, is the center a place of air and light. Next, there is the ability to look out as well as up. The late Christopher Tunnard of Yale, one of the country's most distinguished commentators on the urban scene, made the point that most American cities look alike. You see one, you've seen the rest. What distinguishes a few, he wrote, is that they lie in a distinctive setting and furthermore, a setting which can be seen. The example he gives, the one example he gives for this rare felicity is Portland, Oregon. Few, if any, cities in the world, and I've seen many of them, with a metro population of a million, has a downtown from which you can look up through the streets into wooded hills. It's really extraordinary. Uh, in downtown Portland, to the north, to the south, to the, to the west, and to the east, of course, the river 
and the mountain when it's out. Um, and you know, we don't very often consciously look up Washington Street, say, into the hills. But subliminally, it is there. And subliminal things have a great effect. Also, beyond what we can see, for what lies beyond is there, too, uh, in, the, in the mind's eye while we walk uh, the city streets. To the east, the desert and rim rock, the rushing streams and sage-scented air. To the west, that little valley as fertile as anywhere, while beyond the boom and roar of the Pacific surf. And these vistas, these visions, rather, this knowledge of what lies, what exists around us, is essential to our sense of where we are, reminding us that this little huddle of humans called a city is not unto itself, but is part of the land in which it lies and to which it owes its life. It is a realization which it is perhaps as well to keep in mind, and which Portland helps to keep there, for the simple reason that from this city we can still look out. But is there perhaps a dark side uh, to this great good fortune? Streetwalkers may wonder <coughs> how their successors will find the place 10, 25, 50 years from now. It is said that even within 20 years, <coughs> Metro Portland will suffer a 33% growth in population, a flood tide, they call it. If this is so, it is time, I think, to man the dikes, and in particular, the sluice gates. That is to say, the sluice gates should not be closed, but only that we should watch carefully what passes through them. As Boyd Gibbons has pointed out, the, the the answer to bad development is not stop. The answer to bad development is good development. And good development in Portland is to limit without exception, without exception, the height of buildings so that this already dark town with an average of 269 days of overcast a year will not be darkened even more. Good development, too, is to prohibit without exception, well, perhaps a place like Portland State or one of the hospitals, but otherwise, sky bridges, so favored by retailers because of our small blocks and which would block our vistas through the streets to the land beyond. Good development means other things, of course, as well, but these two prescriptions are essential. Will they be enforced? After all, city officials, entrepreneurs, the others who steer the city's course are no less venal than the rest of us, no less susceptible to money, power, manipulation, and so it may be that some will turn a blind eye to the breaches in the dikes and to the debris passing through the sluice gates. What will happen? Perhaps the best way to determine what a, um, to determine what a person will do in the future is to get some idea of what they did in the past. The same is true for cities. Further, the character of a city, like the character of a person, has much to do with its beginnings. It really does. It's uh, remarkable how these things hang on. San Francisco and Seattle were founded by people looking for gold. Portland was founded by people looking for Eden, a place of fruitfulness, gentleness, and moderation. Prophets, too but in general, not to the detriment of those other qualities. And Portland, they determined, was to be the capital of Eden, <laughs> a capital congruent, suitable to the natural splendor in which it, it lies. This may explain the emphasis 
the city placed on nature right from the beginning. In 1851, the year of its incorporation, platting out the park and plaza blocks, among the first, maybe the first, urban parks in the United States. This value given to parks and open space continued and in a sense expanded to include that other prime element of nature, water. Today, relative to its size, Portland, I think, has more fountains than Rome. Uh, with all our falling water anyway, you wouldn't think we'd need them, but. Finally, it is not uh, surprising, too, when at the beginning of the century, the city chose a symbol for itself. Uh, it chose not from industry, or commerce, as most of the eastern cities did, the smokestack or the dynamo. But from nature, it shows the rose. Those other values, moderation and gentleness, have also helped to shape the city that we see today. For the character of a city, is, as has been suggested, is not the result of accident, but rather of the product of the values held by its, its citizens over time. So the belief in moderation and gentleness has, with few exceptions, saved the city from infatuation with bigness, ostentation, reckless ambition, predisposed it to cultivation over sophistication, to contentment rather than to excitement, to amble rather than to run. Of course, the coin of virtue, as we are prone to think of it, has its other side as well, and it is the side of smugness, for in general, we are rather happy with ourselves. Unfortunately, a failing, but at least um, um, smugness uh, is preferable to arrogance, and so we can be smug about that as well. <laughs> at any rate, if this, uh, in fact, has been the city's character, is it still a reliable indicator of what will be the city's future? In the 1960, 1960s, sorry, this came into question when the city's commercial life began to pass from local ownership and direction to the ownership and control of outsiders. Everything from the banks to the hamburgers. When I was a boy in Portland, Everything was locally owned except the railroads and the insurance companies. And it makes a difference because if your antecedents were here and you expect your descendants to be here, you are careful. Um, well, the question then came, comes, would these outsiders with their impatient energy and contrary values and with no real long-term commitment to the place. I mean, three years later, get transferred to Omaha or whatever. Um, would they treat the city as a sailor treats a port? Um, and then, having had their pleasure, move on to other places? In fact, some, though indeed not all, and some of these people may be present right here now, have done more for the good of the city than many of our lethargic locals. Perhaps more important, however, was another infiltration which began in the 60s and to some extent still continues. Often young and from the East, this group, group is crucially different from the first, for they have come rather than been sent. And they have come to stay. The reason, it would seem, is that they like the kind of place Portland is. In short, they are here to enjoy the city rather than exploit it, <clears throat> to confirm its spirit rather than to change it. So all told, then, the prospects seem rather good that the streetwalkers of the future may continue to saunter a humanly scaled, diverse downtown, may still look up to see the sky and air and out to see the Eden in which the city lies. 
On the other hand, you never know. You never know. And thus it would be as well to keep guard at the sluice gates. Eternal vigilance, Jefferson wrote, is the price of liberty. It is also the price of a decent, pleasant, streetwalker's kind of place. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Terrence O'Donnell. And as one of those lethargic lifers, <laughs> I'm on my toes. Um, your, your description of downtown Portland and the, the beauty that, that we have is what is attracting those thousands of people. Um, 75 more each day have dinner than had breakfast this morning. Um, my concern is, in your perspective as an historian and, and a, a, a great fan of Portland, what is it that we can do to the city club, um, to our churches as good citizens, what is it that we can do to help engage those new people to vote in the park bond measure, support our schools, support our libraries, not be consumers, but be good citizens? Uh, well, I, I really have um, no very accurate idea of what these um, new people do or don't do. But I, it's my impression from having encountered, um, encountered them. It's very interesting. When I go to a party, uh, everyone tends to be from Portland, or no one is from Portland, uh, which is it, curious. Um, this is just sort of an aside. I think Portlanders are very friendly, but really, at bottom, not all that welcoming. And that uh, outsiders tend to stay kind of a bit on the outside a bit. But at any rate, I go to the two different kinds of parties. And um, it's my impression that they, uh, people coming in new, um, as I said earlier, want to kind of keep the city as it is. Um, that they, they um, and that they are, it's my impression as well, that they are fairly, uh, fairly active. There's no way of really determining that. But, um, you know, activity comes out of affection. If you uh, like a place, perhaps even love a place, you tend to take care of it. And uh, so that's a good sign for Portland. I think people who come here like it a lot. And that's why they come. Portland has never been a place that you came to to get a job. You know, it's never really been much of an industrial city. And uh, people come mainly because uh, they they like it. And uh, it's very interesting. You know, more than we know, I think people come out from the east and they visit Seattle and they visit Portland to decide which, which of the two in the northwest they like. And uh, some prefer Seattle. I think all of you know the old saying about the three sisters, <laughs> the three sisters of the northwest. Uh, one is a tart. Well, first of all, to go back, the three cities are, of course, uh, Seattle and uh, San Francisco and Portland. One is a tart, one is a debutante, and one is a spinster. I think it's quite clear who those three are. <laughs> but anyway, so I think they come, they come because they like it. And again, if people like a place or uh, an automobile or whatever it is, they tend to take care of it, and I think these people probably do as well. And, uh -huh. Hello, I'm Leslie Hildula. Um, I was reading some cliff notes of Barbara Tuckman on the March of Folly. Are you familiar? Pardon? I was Barbara Tuckman's March of Folly where she talks about the follies that we human beings oh, have done. Oh, Tuckman, yes. Right, right? I yes. figured you'd be well familiar. So do you think we are doing folly to ourselves in any area these days? That we are what? Committing folly anywhere these days. Falling? Folly. Not, not uh, doing what we should. Yeah. Um, well, I'm not entirely sure um, that um, 
were showing enough concern for the problem of light in Portland. I really think in, in time it will be a problem. As I said earlier, most of the buildings are three and four stories. And they, of course, are going to be replaced. And they will be replaced by buildings of 30 stories or so. If you go out here onto Taylor Street now and walk up toward the library, the Fox Building is gone, and the parking lot is the next block, and the light just pours in. It just pours in. <laughs> now, in a year or two, there's going to be 30 stories on one side of that. What is it? The Goodman parking garage is 15 or 18 stories in the next block, and then the old Knights of Columbus or, or Arrow Club building, that's going to be 10 or 15. Think of the light we'll use, lose. And that's going to happen all over the city, really, as these two and three stories, where the Fox was, the, the uh, western half of that block was one story. And those blocks are all going to be replaced by a very high buildings. And that, I think, is a, is a great concern for the city. And I don't know what can be done except to zone the city in such a way that um, each sort of quarter, as it were, of the downtown has its open place so that when you walk out of these canyons, and that's what it's going to be, Park Street is going to be a narrow, narrow little canyon, that you can walk into openness. So that's one thing which I think maybe we don't think about the future anymore, not nearly as much as our antecedents did. 19th century Portlanders thought a lot about the future, and I don't think we, we do. And at any rate, I think that's one thing that we might be giving more concern to. Andrew Wheeler, a member, kind of a follow-up on the last uh, question. I'll bet you know the kind of thing I'm going to ask. Because you were involved, you were watching the sluice gates as, uh, uh, <coughs> with some of us. Uh, <coughs> we were watching the sluice gates <coughs> when the Martin Frank garage became Pioneer Square. Were we watching the sluice gate when a 12-story long-term parking garage flowed into our park blocks. In other words, I'm wondering if there are going to be people around who are going to be there to keep bad things from happening. Uh, well, I, I don't know whether there will be or not. It seems to me regrettable. Uh, I myself don't know that uh, on that block, the, the, the parking lot block on Taylor, between, what is it, between park, between the, the two, the two park avenues. Um, <clears throat> you know, it is a city, and <laughs> so we can't have the whole thing in parks. Um, <laughs> and we are doing pretty well as it is. As I said, uh, the, the proportion of, of parks to the downtown is really very high. And, but as I said also earlier, we do, do have to, do have to uh, keep some open spaces. I think the ideal solution for all of those blocks between the two parks, the two uh, park systems, um, is if they could be zoned in such a fashion that they would carry narrow buildings, which are not too terribly high, and then by paving or whatever, uh, join up the two parks so that when you pass from the South Park blocks through those blocks to the North Park block, there would be a sense of continuity and the buildings would not be too massive. Uh, otherwise, they're going to make, see, this is sort of a precedent now, and those other park blocks will take uh, buildings uh, new, and some of them 25, 30 stories, and those streets will be awful. I mean, you know, they're narrow, they're about twice the width of that. Uh, so, I don't know if it's too late or not. Please, sir. Erwin Mandel, City Club member. Good afternoon, Terry. It seems that we, uh, as one of the newcomers to Portland, pretty much uh, four years living here, and came here voluntarily, rather than being assigned and planning to stay, seems to me that one of the major issues leading to what you might call the deterioration of the view that you have so eloquently espoused about preservation is the way we encourage the automobile to virtually overrun the city with not just one 12-story parking garage, but parking facilities in the new 28-story building, 
additional parking facilities in the hotel and parking garage going up on 6th Avenue. Would you care to comment on this? We give a lot of lip service to trying to encourage public transportation, but apparently, to a great degree, public transportation still seems almost to be the private automobile. Well, I don't think anything can be done about that until you change the psychology of the American male. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I, the, I, I think the, the automobile, if you forgive my indelicacy, is their alter penis. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't know, and I don't know how that can be changed. I really, um, um, perhaps. it may just become uh, finally so congested that uh, people will have no alternative. But you know, it's very hard to change. When I came back to Portland, uh, the house, little house I uh, bought was about half, a, less, a fourth of a block from uh, the Council Crest bus. And then when I got off of it, to, I had about a two-block walk, and I loved to walk. Well, I rode the bus for the, about a month or six weeks, and I felt kind of like an old maid. So I stopped. I started driving. I felt kind of effete and, I don't know, riding the bus. So I started driving for about two or three months, and finally I said to myself, hey, 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 now listen here, listen. So I put the car down and began to take the bus, but it was hard for me to do that. So how you kind of change that attitude, uh, I don't know. Sure, I think that's Question. it. Yeah. Um, that certainly uh, stand as the most creative transportation answer we've ever had in the city. <laughs> I think Ray Polani may have been doing a little converting work in the back halls. Um, this is a question, a written question from the floor. It seems that in Eastern Oregon, the highway department has a historic marker every 10 miles commemorating every homesteader who went bust. But there is far less recognition of urban history, particularly in Portland's neighborhoods. Do you agree? Sure, I think the more that can be done to remind us that, as I said earlier, we are only passing through, um, the better. And often, um, especially if it's well done, you know, the past is kind of interesting. It's all screwed up, just like the present, but it, nonetheless, it's, it's interesting. So I think the more that can be done about that, the better. And there is an organization, forgive me for not knowing the name of it, the Portland Heritage, group, is it? And they got together, they made a little tiny little mini park for a Portland poet up in Northwest, and they're getting a, a bust of, uh, of John Reed, our most famous communist. It's always I thought, an irony that one of Portland's most famous persons is buried in the Kremlin. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, I, yes, I think that's great to get the more uh, and the more people, especially when new people come on, for them to get some notion of where they are. One of our problems as a people nationally is that we're always moving on. And you know, you don't develop affection or pride in a place unless you stay, at least for a while, more than two or three years, which is about the average move. I guess it's four or five years. So anything that can give people a sense of where they are and who was there before um, is very helpful. I think the time is up, and uh, so I thank you all again. Yeah, sure, Dan. I'm sorry, Dan. Forgive me. Oh, that's all right. Uh, Terry? I thought you were leaving, actually. <laughs> <laughs> With the greatest reluctance today would I be leaving. Uh, Terry, I've always, in answer to the queries from my friends back east describe the difference between Seattle and Portland, that Seattle was a small, big city, and Portland was a big, small town. My question to you is this. How do we preserve, with 500,000 more people coming in the next uh, 15 years or so, how do we preserve that small town character 
that with a civic sense of responsibility that makes Portland so unique as a, a metropolitan area, aside from what we do architecturally or transportation-wise? Well, some years ago, I spent a little time in Zurich. And Zurich then was about the size Portland was about 10 years ago. And Zurich decided that Zurich was large enough that they didn't want it any larger in terms of its site and so forth, that it was a, a good size. So what they did was they did not encourage uh, more industry. I don't know whether they somewhat discouraged it, too. I don't know if they did that or not. But they didn't encourage it. In other words, industry that would provide more jobs and therefore increase the population. So I suppose one thing we could do is not to encourage more industry in Portland. I don't know that we need it. You know, growth, growth in what? Growth in, in, uh, in traffic jams? Growth in, I mean, growth is not always good by any means. Some kinds of growth is, some is not. So maybe not to give be so open-handed with all these tax abatements to bring, <laughs> bringing people in. It's good for the real estate industry and construction industry, but there are other people around too. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> well, Mr. O'Donnell, you've made us all feel uh, terrific. I'm, I'm uh, to drive now over to Eastern Oregon for a family event and I don't want to go. Uh, I want to stay here. Uh, street walking has clearly been good for you, and hearing about street walking has been very good for us. I think all of us will uh, go downtown, sit on benches, sit on ledges, and look up while we still can. So we stand adjourned. Thank you for coming.